Praise the Lord. I'm truly humbled to stand before all of you. Uh, it's truly an honor to minister from the Word of God. Um, I'm also honored to minister with Sister uh, Shija, who will be speaking to us via Zoom. Thank you, Reshma Sister, for the opportunity to speak from the Word. I know we're all here with heavy hearts. We, uh, we have two families have suffered a, a very difficult loss. And may God comfort them, especially Vincy's sister and family, and Bob, Uncle, and Phoebe, Auntie, and family. May God give them comfort during this difficult time that they're facing. God understands the pain that we're going through, and he's ever-present with us. As we're in that attitude of prayer, um, let us continue uh, asking God to speak to us. Charisma read from the word of God that uh, we're no longer a slave, that God has delivered us. And praise God that God is using her, and uh, may God continue to use her in the days to come. So let me start with the question, what comes to mind when we say the word bold? Um, many times when we say the, think of the word bold, we think of it in a negative way, right? We may think somebody who's aggressive or somebody who's insensitive, right? Um, and nowadays, I would say we're probably not as bold because we're, we like to hide behind the mask. I don't know about you. Nobody sees our facial expression. I love to be in a meeting with the mask on or doing something with the mask on because nobody knows what you're thinking. Nobody can read your facial expression. I'm known to be very expressive about how I do things, so it's wonderful about this face mask. We can go to Walmart. No one knows who we are, right? We can go in our PJs. Nobody may not even know who we are, right? And we can slip into places and situations, and maybe no one will know who we are. Sometimes I think the mask may kind of reduce our accountability a little, but that's a different message for another time. Let's talk about boldness. Boldness. Um, so there's two categories of boldness, so that we're all on the same page. Uh, I want to make sure that I differentiate between two types of boldness. We have the worldly boldness and spiritual boldness, as you can see on the slide. Um, and I'll talk about that in detail. Before we get started, let me read from 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. And it reads, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, or in other words, God has given us boldness, right? God has not given us the spirit of fear, but what has he given us? He has given us power and of love and of a sound mind. It's an and. It connects the whole thing, right? So for us to have boldness, there's some ands that we're going to discuss today. I may not come back to this verse, but keep this as a reference point in your mind that I'm using this as a guide for our message today. So let's go back to that differentiation between worldliness and spiritual boldness. So as you can see, somebody who is worldly bold, we see people who are worldly bold, they may portray themselves to be prideful, rude, self-centered, untrusting of others, and they could be very vicious or cruel in how they handle business and speak to others, right? And then there's people who are spiritually bold, and those are people who display humility in how they speak to others. They're very gentle. So it almost seems conflicting, right? How can you be bold and be humble and gentle at the same time? We'll talk about it. Being selfless, trusting of God and others, and loving. This sounds very familiar, doesn't it? And we'll talk about where we see these characteristics. But today, I'm going to start off with discussing what does worldly boldness look like? Um, I don't know, most of the youth probably know this when I say the word Karen, okay? So when I say the name Karen, uh, I don't know if the adults know, typically depicts what worldly boldness is. By the way, Karen is a beautiful name. I love the name, and we have wonderful people of God who are Karens, okay? They're spiritual bold, okay? But we're going to talk for the purpose of this message a Karen who is worldly bold, okay? Who do we see? When we say, man, she's a Karen, right? We see somebody who would display the worldly boldness. They're very arrogant, they don't care. They can cut people to pieces. They don't care what they think, right? They're very cruel and vicious. They're self-centered. They're very discriminatory in how they handle things, right? 
That's what worldly boldness means. In fact, we would say, wow, she's bold. She's loud. She's obnoxious, right? That's what that worldly boldness, that's not what we want, okay? So we don't want to be, so now that we differentiated, that is not what we want to be, is that type of boldness. We're going to talk further. In fact, we see people are quite bold, even though we have masks, uh, people are bold on social media, right? They're bold in displaying their sins, right? So we have people who uh, have, we, talk, we see gender, uh, same gender parades, right? Uh, we see some hot topics that are so openly displayed on social media. Nobody is hiding these things. And in fact, these people are questioning us. So then we're in a odd situation of how to handle this. How do we handle when a hot topic, a difficult topic is addressed to us? Do we just kind of sly away and sneak ourselves out? Or... How are we discussing it? Where are we at when these difficult situations happen? Because it's uncomfortable. It really is. So how does Christ want us to handle it is what's more important, right? Christ wants us to handle it with spiritual boldness. We're not to walk away from it. We're supposed to handle it with spiritual boldness. And how does that happen? How do we get the spiritual boldness, right? We, we have to be filled with the Holy Spirit, it's nothing, there's no easy fix to this, right? We have to fill our flesh in our original being before we died to Christ is what? We have worldly boldness, right? We are cruel, evil, selfish people. But when the Holy Spirit, when we receive Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, we're sealed by the Holy Spirit, and we have that filling experience of the Holy Spirit, what do we have? His characteristics coming out of us. And what is his characteristics? Holy Spirit is gentle, right? We read that he came like a dove. He was very gentle in how he came. Holy Spirit is loving, and Jesus displayed this characteristic of gentleness and holiness, and he displayed love when he came down to this earth, right? He displayed that gentleness and love to the point of death, like a lamb led to the slaughter, did not open his mouth to defend himself. Why is that? Why didn't God, Jesus, defend himself? Could he not have? He sure cut. Many times I thought, Jesus, why didn't you tell that persecutor I was whipping you? I know what you thought about yesterday. I know the sin you did it when you were two years old or three. I know what you did in, as a teenager. He could have just, he could have even told him what they ate for breakfast that morning. He could have laid it out all in the open. Could he not have? Could he not have been like a worldly, prideful, arrogant, slice people to pieces? Cut them off, Right? Be selfish in his motive to defend himself. He could have easily done it. He's God. He could do anything. But Jesus kept his mouth shut. He did not defend it. He could have easily done it. He could have asked the angels to come and slay them all. None of that. It was, you see, you know what? Jesus didn't have an ego about himself. He knew it didn't matter what these people said. It wasn't about him it wasn't about his feelings. It wasn't about his agenda. His only agenda was the salvation of the human race. He had the big picture. That's why he was able to be spiritually bold to the point of death and was able to save the human race. And that's what God calls us to be. He calls us to display the fruit of the Spirit. So remember I asked you what are some of the spiritual boldness characteristics? It's basically the fruit of the Spirit. What is the fruit of the Spirit? It is the Holy Spirit displaying his characteristic through us, not ourselves. Remember, we have died. That's what charisma was pointing at. Our flesh had died. We see that in Romans 6. We died to Christ so that the Holy Spirit can reveal himself through us. So having established what type of boldness we need to have, now we're going to have the practical message of how to be bold. That is what God is calling us to be now. Okay, so it brings me to my first point, boldness in being a child of God. How do you do that? How can we be spiritually bold? We can only be spiritually bold if we know who we are, if we know what our privileges are. When we know that, we can be spiritually bold. It's no big deal. So let's read Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. It reads, 
Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence. Some versions say boldness, so that we may receive mercy and grace and find, sorry, receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. We cannot approach with boldness to our mayor in Yukon, okay? We're, he's not going to see us. We cannot approach boldly to the president of the United States. We cannot approach to our prime minister in India boldly. We will be turned away at the gate, right? But we can approach our God Almighty, the creator of heaven's throne of grace, by his grace and mercy. No archangel is going to cut us off. Gabriel and Michael are standing back. You know why? Because we have straight access. That's the boldness we have. We have to know who we are. Who are we? We have the boldness to approach the creator's mercy seat. Okay? Second thing that we have to look at is 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. So we're establishing how can we be spiritually bold, right? But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may claim, proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Do you understand who we are? We are listed, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. How? Because we're sealed. I said earlier, we're sealed by the Holy Spirit when we receive Jesus. We are sealed. We are marked. The enemy knows who we are too, by the way. We're marked. We're marked by whom? God, to say that we are his possession. Okay, so now I have to say, we're moms. Most of us, I mean, all of us have held babies, right? How do we hold a baby? Do we just kind of haphazardly hold a baby? We're making sure the head is tucked correctly. We make sure the arms are tucked correctly. The legs are placed. We're so careful that this infant is so carefully caressed in our arms, right? We make sure the safety of this infant in our possession is protected by us. We understood the value, right? We are responsible for this infant in our hand. The same way we, the possession of God, is in the hand of God. And we have to understand we are safely tucked in his hand. He is making sure our head is not hit wrong, that our arms are tucked correctly. He's got his eyes on us. We are the apple of his eye. We have to understand that, who we are, and the privileges we have. Then only can we be spiritually bold. So let's go to our next verse. Psalms 46, verse 1 and 2. We all know these verses. We're just remembering, right? This is just a recall message. That's all. We know everything. What, what I'm saying today is nothing new. We're just recalling, right? Remembering. God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. We will be bold, though the earth give away, no matter what natural disasters may come along our way hurricane, tornadoes, whatever, though mountains fall into the heart of the sea, we don't have to be afraid because who are you? You're refuging in his palm. You are his possession. You are the apple of his eye. Understand who we are first, then how can we not have spiritual boldness, right? We have Holy Spirit abiding in us, right? We are in the palm of the almighty creator's hand, what are we afraid of then? We should have boldness, right? All right. So this leads me to the second point. The second point is boldness. Stand and run. What in the world? How do you stand and run at the same time? Is that even possible? What am I trying to say? I am trying to say stand firm in the word of God. Have that boldness to stand firm in the word of God. Number two, be bold enough to run from sin. We have to stand firm in the word of God and be bold enough to run from sin. How do we do that? It's easier said than done, isn't it? So let's read that verse, Proverbs 28.1. What does it say? The wicked flee, though no one pursues them, but the righteous are as bold as a lion. Okay, now we don't typically see the wicked running, right? We usually are as Christians running, right? We're asked to run, right? We see what? The Egyptians were running after the Israelites, right? 
the early church, what happened? We saw uh, the early church, the Romans and the Jewish people running after the early church to persecute them. And the Christians were on the run, right? We see people on the run. So what in the world is this verse talking about? Wicked flee and no one is pursuing. Why are they fleeing? Why are they running? No one is pursuing them. What? Why are they running? What are they running from? Who is chasing them? What is this verse meaning? You know what? Remember I told you that in order to be bold, we have to have what? Power, love, and a sound mind. This verse is talking about the soundness of our mind. It's just talking about the state of mind. Every human being is created with a conscience, right? Let me say it this way. So when, uh, when we touch something sharp, what do we do? We just keep cutting and make sure our fingers cut off? We're like, oh, that was sharp, right? Or if our fingers touch something hot, what, what's the first thing we'll do? Oh, that was hot. Because God made us sensitive physically so that it'll prevent harm to us, prevent from us harming ourselves, right? So we don't cut off a finger or a hand or, or anything causing self-harm, right? Those are physical barriers he has set for us to be sensitive. The same way is the conscience. It's a spiritual sensitivity. Every human being has it. Not the animals doesn't have it, but we have it. That's what makes us different. What makes us different is when sin comes our way, it makes us spiritually sensitive that when we commit something, it causes us to be guilty. And that guilty that God has placed for us is not meant to harm us. Remember I said that the finger cut, it stops us from cutting off our finger, right? Because we are sensitive the same way. When we have that conscience, it allows us to be sensitive from preventing us to harm us spiritually. Okay, that conscience is set not to beat us up. It is to prevent us from repeatedly sinning. So what happens to the wicked? The wicked repeatedly sins and sins, and that conscience is callous. It's not sensitive anymore, right? And so what happens? They're on the run. So they sin, and they're on the run. Run from what? They're paranoid that their sin is going to get caught. It's a state of mind. They're paranoid. They may run from one sin to another as a cover-up. It's a guilty thing that they're doing to cover up their, their, their sense that God has activated within them. And they're doing this running. That's what it means. Wicked are fleeing and no one is pursuing them. It's their guilt causing paranoia to cause them to run, run, run. Who did this in the Bible? We see Jacob did it, right? First thing he did was he stole his brother's birthright. So then what did he have to do? He had to go and put a hairy arm of the, right? Pre pre pretend that he's Esau, right? Right? And he had to do that. Then what did he have to do? He was afraid. He was guilty. Man, he just eat him up alive that he had to make a run for Laban's house, right? And that man ran and ran and ran till he submitted to the hand of God. Till he submitted to the hand of God, he was fleeing. He was on the run. That's what it means when the wicked pursues. We have two other examples that I can think of. We have two disciples of Jesus. Jesus. You guys know where I'm headed, right? Judas Iscariot. He betrayed Jesus, how? To get financial gain. Peter also betrayed Jesus, right? He betrayed Jesus because he was afraid. And he denied Jesus three times. So we have two people who betrayed Jesus. What did these two people do? They are on the run. Why were they on the run? Because they were guilty. They were overwhelmed with this guilt. They didn't know where to go, and they were on the run. And what happened to Judas? He was on the run, 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 and his guilt overtook him, and he unfortunately ended his life. But thank goodness Peter had a revelation. He decided he's going to stop this running business, and he ran straight to the hand of Jesus and received his forgiveness. So how is this Peter on the day of Pentecost, who ran when nobody was pursuing him, stood so boldly to preach and win 3,000 souls. Can you imagine? For sure there was 3,000 people there. For sure there's 3,000 people. More than that, right? 
This man, nobody is pursuing him. He was on the run. Now all of a sudden he's standing so boldly preaching and 3,000 souls were saved. How did this Peter change? When he realized that the righteous are as bold as a lion. Is this his own righteousness? No. He understood that Jesus, the Lion of Judah, is with them. That Holy Spirit, the dunamis power, was with them. And then he had that spiritual boldness to stand firm. Right? So that's where it says, the wicked flee. No one is pursuing them. But the righteous stands firm, bold as a lion. So let's think about, so what does that mean for us, right? Okay, nice job, Phoebe. So what we need to say is when we endure difficult topics, we're going to have to stand firm, but we can't do it on our own. We have to have the Holy Spirit like Peter did. And when Peter had the anointing of the Holy Spirit, he was able to fluently articulate what God had for him to spiritually stand firm, right? So when hot topics come, it doesn't mean we like slowly tiptoe out of the conversation because that's our open door opportunity to stand spiritually bold, to stand firm. And in order to stand firm, we got to know the word. We got to study the word. We got to understand it. We have to know it in and out. So when people question us, we can, through the Holy Spirit, speak the word of God. We have some accountability that we can do. Some people say, oh, God will give us, we can just go. Yes, that's there. But he also told us to prepare. So we have our part. We have to do our homework. We have to do some preparation. Okay, so now part B of point two. So we need to stand firm in the word, be bold enough to address hot topics, and God will give us the boldness like he did Peter, but we also have to have the boldness to run. So many times we think run from sin means running from adultery and fornication. We all do that, right? Those are the things that we're like, oh, we do that. But what about like on our phone, right? On our phone, man, that's the whole world is open to us. We can easily sin and not, not even our spouse will know about it. Like we can actually see anything and nobody will know about it. Well, God knows, right? We have to run from that. We have to set some limits. What about social drinking? We have to run from that, okay? What about being with a church family friend who may take you to an environment that is not conducive to the Holy Spirit? It's a church family friend you have. You and the family friend are together. Uh, what does that mean then? It was a church family friend, right? How do you run from that? What do you leave that person and run? If it's not conducive to the Holy Spirit who is abiding in you, you better run. You better have the spiritual boldness to run. Yes, run. That's what it means. We do need to run. If Jesus says looking at something lustfully is a sin, just looking at something is a sin. Then what do you think smelling, tasting, touching, and hearing is? Just as equally unacceptable. Therefore, drinking socially, being in an environment that's unacceptable, seeing videos, hearing songs, anything that is offensive to the Holy Spirit, run, 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 run. We have to have the spiritual boldness to run. So when we run, it's not easy. It has its consequences. It sure does. It's a very painful consequence. We may lose some friends. We may feel isolated, rejected. It's a tough call to run spiritually from sin as a child of God. I, it's not easy. It's not easy. So how do we handle that? How can we handle that? We have to remember that. When we spiritually run, do you remember that we said earlier that we are in the palm of God's possession? We are his, in his hand. Do you trust him enough that when you cut off friends that uh, maybe hurt or offend the Holy Spirit, 
Do you trust him enough to know that he will bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego friends to strengthen you during your difficult time? We have to have that boldness in knowing that God is so faithful to bring the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But maybe he's waiting for us to cut off those friends that's not leading us in the right direction. It takes a spiritual boldness to run from sin. We see that in, jo in Joseph, right? <clears throat> Genesis 39, 6, it reads, Now Joseph was well built. He was physically strong and handsome, it says. And after a while, his wife's master took notice of him. We know the story, right? Potiphar's wife, day after day, ran after Joseph. And what did Joseph do? He ran as fast as he can from the sin. And you are hoping that, man, that would be a beautiful story. He ran, everything went well, happily ever after, right? No, that's not what happened. He got put in prison. He got put in prison. That is not fair, God. This man ran from sin, and why in the world would he? That just doesn't seem right. That's what I said earlier. Running from sin has a consequence. You may have to go to prison. You may have feel rejected and alone, but remember, you're in the palm of God's hand. And if you trust him enough, then you know that he's orchestrating what he needs to to bring Joseph out. And when he's orchestrating what he needs to bring Joseph out, what did he do? Joseph is second in command. Be faithful in what you're doing. And God is more than faithful in orchestrating what he needs to to place you where he needs to. But it's a process. But do you think during that time, Joseph was being worked on too, right? He was being prepped. Okay? He was being prepped. So, my second point was what? We have to have the boldness to stand firm in the word of God and to run from sin. All right. That brings me to my final point. Yippee, right? <laughs> the last point is boldness to share. This is the whole critical aspect of it. We have to have the boldness, boldness to share the gospel despite persecution. That is very difficult. I don't know about you. Sharing among my friends, my coworkers, my boss, who may not be right with the Lord or may not even know the Lord, or for, like for those of us in the medical field, patients, those who are in college, your college friends, your professors, if you're in high school or middle school, whatever, your school friends, that's hard. It's hard to be bold and share. Nobody said it's easy. It's hard. You may offend them, right? When you say that Jesus is the only way to somebody who doesn't believe Jesus is the only way, that, that can kind of be difficult to deliver that message, right? That's why we need spiritual boldness. Paul gives us an excellent example. We know who Paul is, right? Paul was filthy rich. Do you know that Paul was filthy rich? He was part of the Sanhedrin. Who is the Sanhedrin nowadays? We would say is the current day Supreme Court. This man was part of the Supreme Court. Okay? He was filthy rich. He was well known. He was famous in the Jewish community and the Gentiles, unfortunately. This dude was famous. Everybody knew him. And God calls him out. God calls him out to be bold. And he has to go talk to this Sanhedrin people. He hung out. They came to his home. They ate bread at his home. I mean, like, these are not like casual friends he had at the Sanhedrin. These were intimate friends he had. It was difficult. The Jewish friends he hung out with, his parents, his family, he had to stand bold and say, now Jesus is the only way, and he belonged to Jesus. That took some guts, didn't it? And we think, well, you know, I'm not Paul. But what did Paul say? So we read Ephesians 6.19. Paul wrote the book of Ephesians when he was in prison in Rome, in his first imprisonment. And he's writing this from prison, and he's saying what? Paul is saying, pray also for me that whenever I speak, words may be given to me so that I will fearlessly, some versions say boldly, make known the mystery of the gospel. Wow. Paul needed prayer to be bold? then I, who am I compared to Paul? Like, really, I need a lot of prayer then, right? 
If Paul is asking for prayer, it's okay, people of God. We will be afraid. Paul was afraid, obviously. Otherwise, why would he ask that? Help me to pray, help me to speak fearlessly, right? He was afraid. He was afraid in prison. Paul had the same things that we're, we're going through, but he asked for prayer so that he can reveal the mystery of the gospel to those who are lost and confused. See, Peter, Jesus, they all understood it wasn't about him and his ego. It wasn't about the hurt feelings that they may have if somebody deny or refuses them. Like you pass a track, they say, no thanks. Sometimes it comes like, oh, well, you just take the track. What's the big deal? Like, what's, what's the problem, right? You get kind of a little offended, right? It's not about us, people of God. It has nothing to do with our ego. It has to be the bigger picture. We have lost souls who are going to hell because they don't know Jesus and we are busy being timid. It's not about us. We need to have boldness. That is what God is calling out to be, us to be. It is high time we need to be spiritually bold. This is something God is moving in my heart, okay? I'm just expressing what God has been working in my heart to do. I'm, I'm convicted of it. So in order, so I told you it's a practical message. We're almost coming to an end, okay? It's a practical message. How do we do it? Okay, that's nice. You said blah, blah. You said this, that. Nice. How do we do it? Okay, the next point is the f we have to know the critical foundations, okay? So you can't be spiritually bold if you don't believe Jesus is God. Like, you have to do your homework. You have to know in your heart, per the word of God, that Jesus is God. And he came to this earth and died on the cross. You have to know that. Okay? You have to know this word of God is infallible. That people have compared the Dead Sea Scrolls to this and found hardly any variations but some commas and if buts. Okay? But the essence of this Bible stayed the same compared to Dead Sea Scrolls to the present word of God. You have to know it's infallible. That is written and breathed by the Holy Spirit to the writers. We have to know that. Okay? You have to have a trusting relationship with Jesus. If you don't, there's no way we can have, be spiritually bold. You have to know that those who do not receive Jesus will go to hell. And there is a heaven. So if, we don't, if we're not confident in knowing there's a heaven and hell, it's hard to be spiritually bold. We'll be wishy-washy when we talk to people, right? We have to know our life on this earth is temporary. When we have these critical foundations, then we're able to talk spiritually bold to people. All right, so how do we start? How do we talk to people? I don't know, from my experience, and everybody probably has different experiences. I, can, I, I have the mic, so I'll say my experience. So I always talk with personal experience. Hey, I received Jesus as my personal Savior. Like, and then I tell, oh, how God marvelously led me. Trust me, I have talked to people, and they did not take it good. They're like, oh, that's nice, Phoebe, that God is there for you. I'm so happy for you, and they walk off. And I'm like, oh, God, like I put out my everything, and then I get a, right? But you know what? Later on. The same individual said, nice, Phoebe, came to me when they were going through a difficult time. Phoebe, I'm going through a difficult time. You told me last time about an experience you had that God delivered you. Can you pray for me? I know that your God will hear. Then I get a, get a chance to say, what do you mean your God? It's our God. He died for you too. You can pray to him too, but I'll pray for you. It's my perfect time. So that's how I do it. Maybe you can talk to different people and how they witness and reach out to the people. So there's other things that we need to know. We read in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 23, don't have anything to do with foolish and ignorant arguments because you know they produce quarrels. And Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but must be kind to everyone, able to teach and not resentful. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2, preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season, correct, rebuke, encourage with what? Great patience and careful instruction. Again, this has nothing to do with our ego and our feelings. It has to do with the Lord's name be glorified and people who are lost and confused see Jesus. That's all our purpose is. When we have that, as our agenda, then we don't want to argue. There's no need to argue. If they're not ready to hear it, there's no, don't argue. Just say thank you for your time and just walk away, okay? 
Uh, be kind. We don't need to be like, oh, like that, okay? Just be kind and speak to them. Um, don't get offended. They are going to turn away from you. They may call you a name. It's okay. Bigger picture, not our ego, right? Be patient and be careful. Why is that word careful? God, the Holy Spirit, gives us a spirit of discernment. And we need to have discernment when we speak. We cannot just throw words around to everybody in every environment. You can't go to a club and say, I'm going to preach to those who are lost and confused who are in a club, in a bar. That's just not the place, right? That's being careful. God has given us a spirit of discernment not to go to a bar to witness to people, right? So that's just an extreme example, but it gives you an idea. Be careful. Ask God for wisdom in how to speak. Sometimes we may not be able to speak. We may just only be able to pray for them, right? Um, so having said all that, uh, I'm going to be concluding that we are during the times of Esther and Daniel. We need to stand in the gap, okay? It's such a time as this. Esther knew that what happened to Queen Vashti, but she still boldly, on behalf of her Jewish people, interceded and went to the king. Daniel went boldly because he knew they need to stand in the gap for such a time as this. The harvest is so ready. We got to go. We've got to be spiritually bold. So in conclusion, we make sure that we're spiritually bold, bearing the fruit of the Spirit, filling the Holy Spirit. Make sure we understand who we are. We are in the possession of God. And make sure we stand firm on the word of God and run from sin. Boldness to share without worrying about persecution. And understand the critical foundations of boldness. Let us all be spiritually bold as lion. May God bless us all. Thank you for this time.